Welcome to Imperial Advisor episode 60. It is post the winter court. We've got tons to talk about. How are y'all doing, guys? Baz, how you doing? I am good. I am good. The weather is cold, and uh, I've, I've had a few illnesses over the time, and I'm super busy with college work. But apart from that, good. All right, something. Justin? Yeah, been under the weather as well, but I'm hopped up in paracetamol, so good to go. All right. We've got a ton of stuff to talk about today, like truly, truly a plethora of news. Uh, the Winter Court has concluded. We've got a new Shogun. Uh, the Phoenix Clan took it. Justin, were you shocked? Uh, not shocked. I think the deck was pretty strong. Um, I was kind of shocked, actually, from the point of view of participation numbers. Phoenix was among the very, very lowest, uh, but still managed to take it home. Um, yeah, but I don't know. I... I kind of figured Phoenix were probably about the third strongest clan after Crane and Scorpion. I think the numbers for the tournament bore that out. Uh, but once you hit the cut, it's all about that variance, or at least variance plays a bigger role. So, yeah, and to be honest, like, Jose is a fantastic player. So am I surprised Jose won? Not in the least. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, it, was a, it was a nice result, certainly. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Baz, any comments? Any, what, the, what are the stats tell you? Did you crunch the numbers? Um, well, I mean, we got we got the the page updated as much as I could. I'm still missing a bunch of deck lists, and uh, I think a few more ores are up on Bushy Builder, so I need to move them across. Um, what did it tell us? Well, I mean, obviously, we we had a bit of a surprise when we saw a massive participation in uh, day day one A for Dragon Crab and Crane, uh, but luckily that got resolved before it caused any real problems. Um, I think Lion was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, we e expected better things. Lion were going in with a, a, a pretty good new pack and um, had a lot of good ideas on how things would go. Uh, from people on the ground, I gathered that it was partially that they hadn't had the time to work out exactly what they were supposed to be doing. So, um, yeah, the crane, or sorry, the Lion qualification rate was relatively poor. And I think uh, it's fair to say that they definitely underperformed from what was expected. Yeah, absolutely. Like that was a, it was a big event. It was incredible. It had really good prize support from what I could see. Uh, a lot of stories of that. That's great. And they were playing draft, which was kind of a revealed, not quite at the last minute, but uh, relatively late on. They had a looks like a like a first draft of a draft format. And they put some stuff together. They had people, Tyler was showing people how to build their draft pods or draft pools. Uh, they had a kind of a couple of draft cards made up. And uh, it seemed to be really popular. People seemed to really like it. But, you know, draft's a pretty cool format uh, if you can get it to work for any game. So that was good to see. Uh, I'd be interested in trying it out. Like if it, if it wrangles its way into a supply chain or even if it's just something people put together with a... With a spare set of cards or something, so that's that's good to know about. They announced the Clan Wars box. Uh, it's coming out with multiplayer as a focus, so that's kind of cool. I am desperately not convinced by some of the cards that are. Oh, what's the linked treasure? The one where you can pay, and you're a or you you or an ally can play pay effect. You can both pay. I'm desperately unconvinced by that by that yeah, uh, mechanic. It seems it's just to one it seems just to make it cost one more, but yeah, it'll be there will be legal cards in there, so people with want they want new cards will put, uh, purchase that. There have been a metric ton of stories, including some like very nice entries from like you know kind of fan favorites like Dave Latteru and Rob Denton, and you know tossing that stuff out. So it's been great. So there's been a lot of stuff coming out. Biggest event to come out of the thing is probably the roles. Uh, the people who'd been top of clan were asked, did they want to all, did they want to unanimously choose to free the roles? And in the end, they unanimously chose to free the roles. So roles are free. Anyone can choose to build with any deck. Baz, how do you feel that's going to impact stuff? Uh, I love it. I'm absolutely delighted with the roles being free. Um, I had obviously written a big article uh, talking about that so I'm super happy that it happened and um, I'm not sure I'm necessarily too happy with the way it went down and um, the decision 
or the, the approach of getting all of the top of clans together and having them all unanimously decide um like it, it puts if there were one or two players in there who weren't particularly interested in uh, the roles being free it puts them in a really really hard position you know they don't like they would be known as the person that stopped the roles being freed and i don't think that's a fair situation to put them in i would have much preferred uh if you know tyler had one-on-ones or if there was kind of a, a private discussion for the, the players Obviously, we don't fully know what what happened there. Um, allegedly, the the stone tablets weren't weren't there though. So whether that was one that just um, wasn't happening this year out of a uh, coincidence, or whether uh, FFG kind of had a, an idea that um, the that freeing the roads would be had the preference, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm delighted with the results. Uh, I've been looking at some decks myself, and uh, it is mind-blowing uh what how many options are out there and uh, the, the kind of different things we can do so it's it's an exciting, exciting time for the game i think it's pretty cool justin any thoughts any new exciting options you're interested in progressing it is phoenix just gonna whip right back to air with a, a suddenness that would shock everybody uh i'm actually i i don't think so um i think obviously the the restriction or the the addition of um satoshi to the restricted list puts a severe dent in the deck in terms of its uh, its efficiency uh, and uh, consistency. Uh, but on top of that, uh, it's a deck that has huge problems with Crane, or can have huge problems with Crane. And um, tower, well, decks that uh, that build towers in general, it can simply just stall out against those 100%. So given that Crane are generally just, you know, by, by, um, by Tashimoko, oh, put three fate on them, you know, dupe them up, and then build this huge tower that simply stops you from taking their uh, mm-hmm. their problems. Um, it's I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Like I think there are different options for uh, for that deck. I think there's some a few different directions it can go, but uh, at the same time, I'm not sure it's the strongest option for for Phoenix by a long way at the moment. I, I still think uh, Jose's deck and basically the, the the kind of the two main versions that featured at Worlds for Phoenix of that deck are probably overall stronger against the field. So Marios in chat is saying uh, clan-specific restricted lists uh, should be. Um, yeah, so he's just saying uh, that really the, the restricted list is not a fit tool um, for its generality, or you know the, the generality of the restricted list doesn't uh, effectively meet the or answer the questions that it's intended for, and uh, clan res- clan specific restricted lists should be considered. So, I think it's I think it's very valid. I think that's an awful lot more work for uh, probably overworked designers. Um, but if you're pushing for the very you know the very highest standards of um, of design and competitive play, then it's certainly something that uh, might be considered in the future. Yeah, I think at the moment the current restricted list is. Uh, it's a little bit wonky in terms of what it does that there are cards on there because they're a problem in one clan or not a problem in another clan there's cards on there because one clan can stack them up and another clan it just cuts tools away so I think yeah it could definitely be considered Uh, you'd have to get someone to do it yeah yeah that's always the trick some of them are soft bands as well so they're they're kind of cards that will never see play now because they're just slightly below the curve for what you're expecting out of the restricted list cards. But yeah, I mean, but I, I, you know, as I said, I think that's something that, you know, probably should be tabled for, for the immediate, uh, for the immediate future. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a process and what we have yeah. now is better than what we didn't have before. Oh God. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, but you know, I mean, it's like, it's a, it's a new game. It takes time to get these things right. As we've said before. So uh, yeah, maybe in the future, it's something to consider. For sure. I think you'll definitely need to see what shakes out of some of these changes uh, because I wouldn't be confident predicting what's good at the moment at all. And uh, like we, we could definitely do with, hey, can uh, can someone else take a look at this, try and figure out some stuff before we make any changes? I mean, I agree, I agree completely in concept with it, uh, but we'll definitely need to see. Like, I mean, there was talk for a while that there was going to be uh, a new core set coming out at Gen Con. Um, you know, there's rumors about that. We don't know if that's still the case. Uh, 
but like if it was coming out um is that gonna re- is that gonna resolve most of the changes like cut charge out of the game or something cut some of the other problematic cards out of the game and they might need to kick they can kick the can of uh, the clan restricted list down the road a bit further we'll have to see we'll have to see what the the format is like uh in a little bit really so um we were kind of reflecting on while we were getting on the uh the new Kodai season got announced just in time for PAX, right? Like, yeah. it's literally just in time for PAX. So, we got to see what the new 2020 Kodai season looks like. And with in relation to that, we thought it'd be good to take back a look back at some of the previous seasons and kind of see what's been, what's improved and what has kind of stagnated or maybe gotten a little worse. So, um, before we start, Baz reminded me about the Madrid Kodai. And the first Madrid Kodai we ran had 400 players, ran seven rounds with a piece of software that kept trying to kill us. Um, and it was it was a 14-hour day both days because that's how long it took because there was no end of round procedures. So, we had like seven rounds... Everyone had to go six and one. You need to be undefeated for Hadamoto. You need to run it using Tome, and Tome kept trying to crash and destroy us. Though there was no end. Of, the end of our procedure was, hey, uh, you know, count, uh, end of the turn, count your tiebreakers, play until you get there. That could be another thirty minutes. It was ridiculous, and yeah, it was. Oh, it was. I'm so glad it's changed. It was horrific, horrific the first year. Um, so there was good changes made. We they've moved largely to accepting events being run in Lotus Pavilion, which is a far better piece of software. We've got we no longer we have six rounds now rather than seven. Uh, Hadamoto is more reasonable to get. The time of the round rules are miles better. So those are big, improving changes. So I'm happy with that. Baz, anything else to change that you were like, yep, that was great, or you know. Uh-huh. Yeah, so uh, we now have floor rules, um, which is kind of funny because we had this discussion uh, when we were at Madrid and uh, it was said to us, floor rules have been put together. We're just waiting on some final sign off. Um, And they did eventually get that signed off. But dear God, it took a while to to get from where it was then to where we are now. Um, Yeah, and yeah, they did the graduated cuts, which were kind of interesting. So you had to get at least 2-2, two, two, was it? In the Samurai round to make yeah, it in yeah. the Magistrate phase and a bunch of weird stuff like that. I, I do remember playing in the the Cork uh, Kotai that year, and by the time I got to, to Game 7, like my brain was literally melted. And I know some players are well up to it, but uh, it, was, it was rough. And um, we've come a long way and uh, the events that we've had this year have been a lot smoother. Like a lot of the kinks have been ironed out. Um, I'd say, I arguably say, the prize support has been better this year than it was the year before. And like that first year's prize support was pretty good. Um, so, I think it's I think it's more interesting because people get choices about what to pick up uh, because true. you can choose to spend your koku kind of where you want, which is good. Like anything that increases people's choice is a good thing. Because people feel like the their choices matter more when they've got so much koku to spend, uh, but there like there are it's not all it's not all super happy. I, I do think that towards the end of the season, there were definitely players who had kind of used up their koku or burned through their koku, and that la- that end injection of fresh prizes was incredibly valuable and exciting for people, and it would be good to see them roll back out and. Be available in other locations for people as well, or doing something similar like that, like a, a, mi- a end of season or an end of, near the end of season injection of new stuff. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that that last one in um, uh, Krakow was kind of funny because the price support turned up a little bit late, and because of that, everyone was hoarding their kaku, and um, the the imperial coffers ran out. We, we yeah. had to. We were essentially giving IOUs to people because we no longer had the metal kaku anymore, um, which which was pretty well. But I mean, that was just to to show that people were really keen to get these new promos. Um, and what we did see in that season, um, 
and I guess we saw it in the previous one as well. And I'm not sure. Maybe it was more over over here in Europe than it was in the US. But every time I went to one of those events, I saw all of the same people. I certainly saw new faces, but there were so many people that just did their best to turn up to every one of the big events that they could. Um, and there was a real good kind of community spirit about it. Um, oh, actually, yeah, that's one of the other things that um, for the US... Um, it was actually a little bit easier because uh, the previous year a lot of the events had been convention locked, um, and uh, the, you know organized play did a lot of work to kind of make that a little bit easier for players to get access to, which was which was great. So you know these these are all great improvements. So uh, things things definitely have been on the up and up so far, at least. Yeah, um, I mean it's uh, so there's definitely a lot of good stuff. Um, there are still some issues. Now, we are a little bit frustrated on this topic because we tried to get our point across to FFG because we ran, myself, yourself, the other members of the team, uh, Meg, John, um, Rob, we helped run a lot of events. Rob was at nearly every event in Europe, um, and or in fact, at every event in Europe, I think. We did our best, and we tried to collate a bunch of feedback, and we passed it on. And we said, this is stuff we think you should really change because pretty much everybody agrees with us about this. And it hasn't happened yet. Now, I'm hoping it will happen, but it's probably not going to happen for this season. And I think it would help a lot. So some things we, we talked about, we surveyed players, we asked players right from the top of the p people in the top cuts and all the way down. We asked people, we said, okay, like, how do you feel about it being 6-1 to get through to the cut? Like, would anyone feel hard done by if it was 5-2? And no one felt it would be hard done. No one felt hard done by if it was 5-2. And there's a reason we think that would be important, because a lot of players feel that if they make the cut, they achieved something in the tournament, and they're more likely to come back and try again next year. And having defined goals people can achieve, and a level of achievement they can feel comfortable about, is a good thing. If you looked at, we had a look at one stage, Baz, at who won the games, the like the pairing up games, right? And it was yeah. nearly always the, the player in a stronger position in the turn, wasn't it? Very rarely uh, did that guy lose out. Uh, typically, and it's it's especially evident when um, when you've got challengers. So when your undefeated player go, gets paired against a you know a a uh, player who's already lost four games and uh, just managed to scrape in because the rest of their clan did did even worse. Like that's that's basically a surefire game for um, that that player who who went top. It's basically a buy for them. So I always found that a little frustrating. Yeah, I mean, I think I like enlarging cuts because I like more people feeling like they accomplished something in the tournament. And when you want to run big tournaments or sizable tournaments and have a healthy community you need to make sure that all of the tiers of players are being catered to, to a certain extent. It can't all just be all the glory is heaped upon the person who wins it. It needs There needs to be different levels of achievement within that. So a player can say, okay, this year I'm going to make the cut. And it's so hard to make the cut that making the cut is nearly synonymous with getting Hadamoto. Yeah. Where that should be, like, there should be Okay, this year I was good enough to make the cut. Maybe next year I'm good enough to get Hadamoto. And some players can go, well, I made Hadamoto. So I got the cut and then I made Hadamoto. And then you're talking about getting top four, top eight, whatever. But you need little gradations of achievement available to people to say, okay, I did get better. This year I made the cut. Or I went to four codis and I made the cut all four times. That matters to players. And it matters to the... You can't just have, okay, the top eight players, a lot of the time were the same players. These guys all made Hadamoto again or got Hadamoto the second or third time or whatever. You need to have opportunities for other players to distinguish themselves and feel like they've achieved stuff. That's how you keep a tournament system rolling. It's like, okay... You made you set yourself your own little goal and you achieved it. Like Justin, do you have any strong opinions on that yourself? Do you just agree? Agree? Oh, I completely agree. Um, like for me, an X minus two cut. Uh, like generally in like in competitive card games, you expect in a in a Swiss in a, in a Swiss setting, 
you expect one game where your deck may just completely self-implode um, and it'll self-destruct. Uh, just the cards will come out completely wrong. That happens less in five rings, but it still does happen. Uh, you expect one game where you meet uh, a dreadful matchup, which is almost impossible to to, to beat, um, and that gives you your your kind of your your two your two losses, and you have to win the rest. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. Um, it's a reasonable expectation uh, for a player to make the cut under those circumstances, and making the cut is a reasonable reward um, with just two losses. Uh, and as you said. Uh, it gives so many more players the the impetus to uh, to win uh, because the, the the bar is not so stratospherically high um, that a bit of bad luck or a bad matchup almost almost eliminates you straight away, uh, and it just adds um, you know you you have you have bigger cuts so you have more unpredictable cuts, um, and that allows clans who are lower on the totem pole to potentially, you know, uh, like like a, a clan, uh, say for example, Lion at the moment, who would never make it in on uh, under the current system. They're just they're just not good enough at the moment, or at least they haven't shown themselves to be good enough for, for quite some time to make it in in, a, in an X minus one system. Uh, in an X minus two system, well, maybe a few Lion players do make it, in, and that's that's good for the game. Um, you know, you've got greater clan representation, uh, and sometimes, you know, one of those lion players could just go on a lucky run and take it away. So, for a lot of different reasons, I think X minus two is is good. It's it's good for the players. It's not really difficult or trying for the the organizers or the company to run. Um, and it's yeah, I mean, even from personal experience, like just the X minus two. Is is a more enjoyable, more relaxed, more fun experience, um, and I think that's you know if you have, I mean, Five Rings is a small game, so I think that's kind of the the, the wheelhouse you really want to be shooting for. Like, it's never going to be a hyper competitive game with incredible prizes that reward the you know the the ultimate pinnacle of competitive play. So, just include people more. Absolutely, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing to lose. And just on that, um, because of some of the numbers we've seen in some of the US events particularly, but some of the European events as well, uh, often the we've had to include extra players. So often you've actually seen players who've gone four and two have got in because the the bracket needed to be rounded up to top eight or top 16, kind of depending what it was. Um, so you're not going to see, like, it, we're kind of almost there already. Um, for some of the events, for so for the smaller events, often they'll get in with that X minus two. Um, ironically, it's the larger events where we're actually letting less people in, as it were, or less by a percentage. Um, I'm not sure how much of a difference it would change, but the advanced tournament structure uh, that never seems to get used, like the basic tournament structure, never seems to get used by FFG at the moment. They always, it's always uh, the special structures, but. Like for that one, there is like the top eight, top thirty-two, top sixteen cut. Like even even moving to that, rather than just this um, super crazy uh, X minus one, I think would would definitely improve things. Yeah, actually, and Ida Yesage in chat has uh, a point as well that a forty-two point cut is going to encourage players uh, to play and finish their games within the time allotted. You know, it's because if you if you have an easier cut to make, then you know, it it encourages players to, to finish their rounds on time because a single loss isn't as utterly catastrophic as it can be. Like, you're not encouraged to claw and fight every inch of the way uh, to try and eke out a potentially hopeless game. You know, a lot a single loss doesn't doesn't effectively destroy you or put you in a really bad position, especially if you lose early. And just on that, what I see the points, um, 43 points confuses players. Really does. Because new yeah. players who are on their first event, they think, just from looking at it, that that means they win four games and they're in. No. They have to win five games. Why and, is it 43? Yeah, and, just so you can't get in with, with two losses. And I do the yeah. announcements. So I have to stand up there and go, I have to explain this now, just in case this is somebody's first event. And it's like, okay, it's two mod wins and one... like It's, it's crazy. Two mod wins, one full loss. And it's, it's berserk and three full wins. It's like, Wait, what? And I was like, yes, it's it's. You think your mind says, ah, oh, four wins. It is not. It is five wins. 
because you cannot get you cannot uh, fi uh, fold, spindle, or mutilate uh, four wins, indicating that many points. It's just a slightly unfortunate. Another thing, yeah. and let's talk a little bit more about you know punishing the upper uppers, the second upper tier of players, the mid carders, the mid card players, right, who are like on their way up, getting better, honing their skills. So you don't make the cut, but you're like, hey. At least I get to play in the invitation, or not the invitational, in the uh, proven, proven grounds, and I get to win some more cards. And hey, I might go undefeated. I might get my invite to Worlds. Let's do this thing. And then someone gets knocked out of this of the uh, day two, and gets just to charge in on a, a like on a best positive record and beat you. Like, that's heartbreaking. Like, that was the better player out of the field. You've got a chance to perform now, and they just show up again. And everybody we talked to about this thought, yeah, this isn't Yeah, it isn't super nice. It's not really fair. The better players, we asked all of them, they're like, yeah, it's not It's not great. We do it because there's more cocoa on that stake, but it's really yeah. kind of mean. And <sighs> you've got to take I... care of those middle middle of the road players. You've got to look after them, give them a chance to get better, Give them a chance to improve, but don't like crush their spirit all the time. Yeah, well, I mean, give them the encouragement and the enticement to improve as well. Because if you're put in a situation where in the proving grounds, there's not really that much point in competing because, as you said, someone's going to get knocked out in top eight or top four. They're going to come in on maximum wins. They're just a vastly better player. And they're just, you know, you're probably just going to lose the same, the, you know, in the same fashion that you possibly did um, in the, the, the Swiss qualification. And that just discourages people from playing. Like, why would you put yourself through that necessarily? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's just the proving grounds. And the, the players who consistently come top of the proving grounds are the ones who proved that they were good players the day before because they made the top cut. Like, consistently, we've seen the proving grounds, undefeated yeah. players are the ones that had come from the top eight. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is, like, getting to the cut, that is that is the reward of getting to the of getting to the cut. The cut is the reward. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, maybe FFG can do something to, maybe they can, you know, just slightly increase the, the, the prizes that are given for people who are eliminated in top 16, top 8. Um, because obviously, if you're taking away the, the chance of them play in, in, in the proving grounds, then that's also a little uh, unfair as well, perhaps. Maybe not unfair, but it's it's a bit of a downer. Um, so, I mean, but I mean, uh, yeah, and, like, but I, I agree as well. Like if, if you make the cut, that's your reward. Your reward is you got into the final tournament and you, you, you had your shot or you have your shot to go the whole way. Um, you know, you shouldn't be given just the, the automatic high reward back door out where you're just going to end up crushing, like you said, I mean, up and coming players, um, and up and coming players should be given every encouragement to, to, to play and to win prizes. Um, because then even if you are not a, a cut quality player, you still have a shot at an, at an invitation to worlds. And that's amazing. So it, is it uh... yeah, again, it's yeah. <laughs> which, which, <laughs> which conveniently conveniently leads us on to our next point. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah. Um, so then, Invitations in practice have not worked out to be anything. That's kind of the unfortunate fact of the matter. Uh, there isn't the ridiculous demand for slots, so that on day was it day one of Worlds or the LCQ last chance qualifier. Last chance qualifier, like everyone just got in, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. and they they announced it at the start of the morning, um, and anyone who was there and was playing in that said that was some of the best self award they played because everyone played all the rounds like you were still competing to hit top but the pressure was off and people could relax now um i think i think i saw something from ffg or you know someone recounting how ffg had looked at it seen that if they were to do a cut to fill up uh, the spaces that they had because basically they kind of allotted a certain amount of space for the event um, and I think they would have been 10 over. So they would have been kind of taking 10 people out of the event and saying, you can't play, but everybody else can. So at that point, they decided, you know, we'll let everyone in. I'm not sure I necessarily believe that because it's been really obvious, for, at least to, to players who've been paying attention, that everyone was going to get in. Like the, 
we don't have a massive tournament scene. We've got a set of diehard, dedicated players um, who you know we knew we were going to be heading to this, and we've got a lot of players who just love the game and are interested. So, well, that's the same thing, really. But like, the, there's a, a non-competitive but still diehard, dedicated uh, player set is what I mean. Um, but there was never never going to be enough to max out this event and do a super competitive league one. Now, if they wanted to. Um, FFG could have really limited the size for those uh, winter court days and, and not filled out their capacity, um, and that would have been an elite style event. But you know, I mean, there's there's not much of a difference on the numbers. So yeah, I, I think they knew maybe a month or two before going in that they were going to be letting everyone play anyway because they had the numbers and there was no reason not to. And you know what? We know now. 12 months in advance, that next winter court, no matter what's said about invites, everyone's going to get to play. Um, so yeah, I, I don't see any value at all in these in these invites this time around. Yeah, uh, like, it it's reassuring to see that, and I hope, I would love it if winter court was as good an event next year as it was this year. That there was just a bit of consistency there, and it's a big, premium, cool event. People know if we go, it's going to be great. And that there's no drop-off or no thing. Because it was exactly the same event again in terms of quality. I think that would be magnificent. I think a little bit of assurance of, okay, this is going to be good, is ideal. Because especially for me, getting over there is a not a nothing proposition. It's uh, annoying from work point of view. It's annoying from a... Paying for flights point of view, it's annoying for travel point of view. If I'm guaranteed it's going to be excellent, I'll strongly consider going. So, but like you need to have a little bit of a little bit of you know certainty about that because the first year, like I was there, it was a bit rocky, you know, and it, it was great to see it be really good this year. It was great to see it be really good this year, and that's uh, very good. Now, there's a couple of things we want to mention about feedback we gave. Um, so. They need to be, if you're going to have point scoring be a thing, there needs to be an official way to track it. Okay? Now, I want you to imagine the NFL, if the NFL refused to publish standings. They're just like, look, they're there. We're keeping track of it. We know who's winning. You guys can figure it out if you need to, but, like, that's on you to figure it out. You know? We're keeping track of it. Don't worry. That would really cut into people's ability to like casually drop in and say, okay, let's see how everybody's doing. You need to have some official or quasi-official record to go, here's the current point standings, you know? And it needs to be somewhere where people can access it without needing to know, oh, you go on this Discord, you message this guy, you get this uh, Excel sheet, or you, you know, get the link to that Excel sheet. It should be just or, there. Or the Facebook group, yeah. which is a private Facebook group that is not controlled by FFG. If the Facebook, if Elf of our Facebook admins decide to come together, no longer accept anyone and lock everything out, that's an entire channel that seems to be the primary way for FFG to communicate with the player base at the moment, or at least the fraction of the player base that is on Facebook and is registered on that particular for, uh, Facebook group. Like e even if they just did it with Twitter, it would be it would be better. Sorry, that's that's a. That's at the rant for another day, but uh, yeah, sorry, go on. So you need to have that favor race there. And like some points kind of came out of nowhere. Now we know where they came from in the end. We figured it out, but they kind of came out of nowhere because they were a part of the florals. They were there. They were there in the TO documents. We may not have seen all those documents, but they were there in them. And not everybody understood that they could give out those points or people weren't sure whose responsibility it was to give out those points or create opportunities to win those points. And it would be nice. I think those points are a great idea, by the way, I think there should absolutely be points there for stuff like costume contests or other stuff. There should absolutely be different ways to win points there, but you have to keep a public record. So people know guys, we're five behind. We can still win this. You know, whereas people go, how much are we behind? One, we got this. We won three. Wait, you know, where did when did Dumbledore just arrive here and give Ronald Weasley a point for you know, uh, like turn himself into a rat? What what just happened? You know, 
And you want to avoid that. You want to basically, it needs to be transparent because that generates excitement. Because it looks like bullshit if it's just like, oh, look, you know, this just came out of nowhere. And it didn't come out of nowhere. It's just nobody knew that it happened. So yeah. you need to be transparent so people can get excited. If they can't, you know, get excited, you're just going to bleed off interest. And you need to keep people there going, okay, cool. We're five behind. We can still, we're only five nil down. We can still win this, you know. And you yeah. need to, people feel like they've got a chance. And if they don't have a chance... There's got to be something else to play for. I'll put it like that, you know? Yeah, it needs to be a race. And in a race, you can see how everybody else beside you is doing. And that yeah. pushes you forward. That gives you the impetus. But if everyone's blind, uh, blindfolded, and then just shoved out into a darkened room, you know, where's the finish line? I'm not sure. Where is everyone? I don't know. Yeah, pretty much. And I think we all have stories from old 5R about the insane lengths that certain players and player groups will go to when, you know, the the race is, uh, well, well, <laughs> when people know where the race stands. The absolutely. The players will go to absolutely, I mean, they'll, they'll go to incredible lengths. How, how many countries did John end up going to in the end? Uh, he hit. There were uh, there were four major events: one in Australia, one in Europe, one in North America, one in South America. He the only one he didn't go to was South America because he was like, I don't want to go to Brazil on my own when I don't know anybody. And that's the only reason so just, he didn't go. So just three continents. Yeah. Just and, uh, three yeah. continents. He, he, but, he walked, but I mean, yeah, okay. the thing is, but this is amazing as well because then you have you know you have players who are making their own legend in the in the game and in the story like we still talk about this absolutely um or like when you had the the, the spider shadowland split like the the lengths that andrew warnatov went in terms of play time um you know his own money everything to to, to see the gribblies come back um and i mean he failed but that doesn't in any way you know diminish the incredible effort that you know one single person put into the game and single-handedly, he almost flipped what would what most people considered to be a completely lost cause into a victory. And this is like this is amazing stuff. You know, it's it's kind of part of the reason why we play Five Rings. Yeah, so, and I, um, I think the maybe FFG underestimate a little bit um, because the release schedule I think hasn't been as aggressive as as it could be. Um, like I know we saw, yeah, one of the the organizers was wearing a Keyforge hoodie, which which bothered me slightly. But the important part about that is that there's no L five R hoodies, and if there were L five R hoodies, L five R players would buy them because L five R players are are lifestyle dedicated, gamers. Commit, li yeah, lifestyle gamers. That's exactly it. Um, and any product that you release is probably going to sell. Uh, you know, maybe you're not going to get you know, massive, massive magic style release stuff going on. There's just not enough players for that. And um, but this is a group of players that are going to keep paying money for any product, anything that gets put out. I'm super excited to see that there are two novels on the way, and um, so not just the the small, um, what are small novels called? Novellas. Novellas. No, yeah, not just the novellas, but actual proper books. Uh, it coming out and one of them hints at maybe being a full series so that's coming out from the the new asmo day uh, book crew and the authors are from black library which i am super excited by um but yeah i mean we, we kind of got that second hand unfortunately rather than it being hyped up but alpha board players are going to buy that um, and we're going to keep paying money for this absolutely fantastic world and game so yeah the daidoji shin books Thanks, Hammer. That's uh, yeah. that sounds like that's going to be awesome. But I mean, even go. I mean, going back to to old Five R again. Like, do you remember? You remember the clan T shirts? Those were uh, a source and a symbol of pride. You know, like people would would buy their buy their T shirts, their clan T shirts, and they would go to tournaments wearing their T shirts. Um, some of the most incredible moments in the game have uh, revolved around T shirts. Yeah, uh, I think. Um, yeah, like the. Um, can, <laughs> I don't know if I'm, if I'm gonna if I'm if I'm gonna be giving spoilers for for what's coming up in Clan War and stuff like that. But like there was a World Championship where one of the Phoenix players uh, in the top four pulled off his Phoenix T-shirt to reveal a Shadowlands T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it was 
<laughs> yeah, it was like we are the bad guys, ah, fooling. It's a, you know, so like players players will find a way to to tell stories in this game because so it's those, what the what the world is about. Those t shirts came out like there were t shirts with Clan Mons in the FFG world at the start, and I think they were at one of the events or something, or maybe the FFG guys were the only ones who had them and they weren't selling them. I have no idea why they aren't aren't doing the rounds. Like a simple yeah. t-shirt with them on would be super popular. But the thing is, they have such beautiful artwork as well. You know, yeah. there's no reason for just a simple mon. You know, people will people will pay money for for high quality items. They just yeah. will. And um, um, so yeah, I. So anyway, but I mean, I, th- I think we I think we're maybe <laughs> we're maybe <laughs> getting detoured down the the merchandising and marketing uh yeah side of so things, but, uh, let, let, let me just mention luxury playstyle um which we are the only podcast that isn't sponsored by that, that's <laughs> fine we don't need we don't need sponsorship but that's a re- those are ridiculous quality things that an amazing number of players have paid for um, yeah. and if if ffg had released that product instead you know we would have bought from ffg from that so yeah this there's there's a lot of un- untapped potential in this um, in this player base uh, that I think FFG uh, could realize. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, just there are more revenue streams available. So. Yes. And take, look, take our money. The Hadamoto yeah. thing is worth a uh, worth a bit of discussion as well. So Hadamoto yes. started out as something very strong. Um, you got. The basically the Hadamoto's were meant to be put on the Hadamoto page. Uh, if you got Hadamoto multiple times in a season, you won additional prize, the token box. Uh, Hadamoto's got a trip to Worlds and Grand Kodai's, wasn't it? Or it was some the no, best, they, the best ha- Hadamoto's Hado- always got their invite. So, yeah. for yeah, the first year, well, I, I think originally we thought it was for as long as they had it, so for two years they had the invite. But apparently that got, I, I felt like that got downgraded, but it was interpreted as just being when they win it first time, which, yeah. which we still have. Uh, Hadamoto's were meant to get an assembly area. Hadamoto's were going to meant to get tar- called out at the start of the event. Hadamoto's were uh, meant to uh, lead the charge at the start of the thing. And these things have gradually gone away from Hadamoto to the point where I think Hadamoto is basically now, you get a big pin, you get a little pin, and you get your clan, uh, your clan uh, play map. Which is lovely and all. It's it's really nice, but uh, it was initially the coolest thing about the game when it start, when the organized play started up, and it's been chipped away at by circumstance and by uh... yeah. Chat chat is pointing out you don't get the little pins anymore now. Yeah, um, one of the things that had always been there all along and just kind of disappeared this year for no reason that we can see. Um, is um, you used to every event you got to walk home with a pin, and the idea was you brought went to your local store. You went, I am the Hadamoto, come get me, and you know whoever beat you got to get that pin. So it was a way of bringing that back to the the local player base um, and getting a bit of excitement going. But yeah, they they took that away. I have no idea why. I I just like you know I'd be the the, the voice of. Um... Well, uh, a slightly dissenting voice here. Um, a lot of the extra stuff for Hadamoto's is super, super fiddly uh, to track and implement um, in terms of kind of pins, like breaking pins. Like it's a, it's a, it's an additional cost that you basically have to keep on shelling out for that is of questionable value, to be so, honest, in so terms the, of growing the, the game, and in, expanding the game. In relation to the pins, the only thing they've taken away is that final pin that a Hadamoto walks away with at each event. So for beating a Hadamoto, unless the chat can object to it, for beating a Hadamoto at the event, you still get your pin. So they're still producing these Really? Pins. It's just oh, they're okay. not they're, they're not still in the picture. To the Hadamoto. They're still in the they picture there. There's a big pin yeah. and the little pin. Uh, I yeah. actually think In that case, I don't know. Yeah. I I think that I would get rid of some of the Hadamoto stuff or keep like not put it back in but I would definitely okay let's let's talk a little bit about in the replacement for the favor and glory system for this year which is oh, the, yeah. which is the tides of war yeah we haven't so, gotten to that yet 
this is this ties in about the Hada model because it's about what players can achieve um by playing off of all what can you achieve what can you get done by actually going out and saying okay i'm going to play i'm going to do well i'm going to become a Hada model what do i get well there's issues with this new system it doesn't change behavior that's the first thing uh four tides of war you're gonna go i'm gonna try and win the game yeah is there like oh, sure. there, there's a card the wild crazy idea i never thought of that yeah there's a card for uh basically for winning the uh like there's a card for winning the most games in the cut there's a card for like drawing the most games or winning playing those games against your clan Same in card. the cut yeah and there's a one for losing the most isn't there uh, so, yeah, making a cut, but uh, not making it be interesting. With so theoretically, assuming there's a reasonably even spread in the cut, that should maybe go to three three clans. Yeah, yeah, maybe because they tried to adjust it so that Poss you know it only yeah. counts Poss possibly, possibly two. But yeah, yeah, that doesn't change anything about how you play. That's just that's how it worked out. This system, like a player, can't really affect that, can they? Like uh, they they, go, they they can't pair themselves against their own clans, so yeah. that whole dissension one is completely random. They're always going to be trying to win, you'd expect. Um, so if they win more, they get the tides of war, which I guess is cool. Um, and if their clan does really badly, uh, they'll get fiery vengeance. So I guess whichever clan. And this is a weird one. So, uh, so if you're the bottom two clans first, and if it was recorded somehow, what you want to do is get into the cut and concede your first game. That is the only way you could materially affect it, other than just winning, which is stuff you were yeah. going to do anyway. So that's a nice theory, but I don't think that's true because you want to. It's not. I don't think it's going to be the weakest clan gets that particular prize. I think it's going to be a clan that's relatively good. And good enough to make the cut, but then loses a ton of games in the cut. Um, yeah, yeah, like that. That's an, like a score. Yeah, Scorpion are probably going to be it. There's an, there's more games, so clan gets rewarded. So, I mean, I I understand the theory behind this, but from looking at like we've been at a lot of tournaments. This isn't satisfying. Like, what, are, what were the things we saw that drove a lot of interest this year? One of them was winning the favor points. And you had people going to extra events to try and squeeze out some more favor points. And you had players then going, actually, I'm going to go to this event because I think if I get one point from this event, I'm going to get the award and I'm going to get the the flights and travel, the travel and yeah, accommodation rules. That was the big one. It wasn't. Yeah. I, I didn't really see players competing for uh, the country titles or the favor. Like they were just incidental. I know. I know one of the Scorpion players. I think it was no one of the Crane players felt bad because they thought they'd. I think they'd made the cut and then lost, which lost them a point, which might have meant that they lost the prize. But you know they were doing their best anyway, so it wasn't like they were changing their behavior in any way, shape, or form. Um, so yeah, the only one that really drove people was that win as many events as you can, get as high up, be the top Hadamoto for your clan, get a reward. And that's gone. Yeah. So, like, I would look at something differently. I would be looking at, okay, you need to give players a way to make a meaningful choice um, while playing the game. So I would be looking at maybe at the start of the season, FFG said, okay, you have three potent two or three potential choices here for a track for your clan to go down or whatever. And the basically you go, okay, you pick you play one of these three cards in your deck, and there are cards that are kind of mutually exclusive like that already, or you go, you have to, if you play two of them, you have to dominate which one you're actually supporting. You put that in, and if you make the cut, you contribute something. And I think you could do it as, if you show up and play it all, you contribute something. 
and then if you make the cut you contribute something more and if you win you contribute a hell of a lot more and then you can look at stuff like Hadamoto's uh, contributing more but possibly losing a point getting the other side more points or something so what you want to look at is effectively ways to incentivize players to go to events because it matters that you went to an event yeah because that's what actually drives people to go to l5 war events it is a consequence if i show up and try that's what you want to do you want people to think i'm there that mattered even if it only mattered by a point you know and that's this system doesn't do that this system is there it's a cool idea whatever but it's not going to change how people play it's no one is going to be like well because of this i definitely want to make the cut they were going to make the cut or they were going to not make the cut this doesn't alter what they do but yeah. you want them to like i would even be tempted to do funky stuff like say hey crap you know we've got some points here if you're a crab player and you choose to play with support of the crab instead you earn people you earn more points but you're playing with support of the crab your deck's weaker you know do something like that where you're like okay i'm playing support of the crab i don't have a seeker i don't have a keeper i don't have a clan splash i'm just trying to win it with my clan stuff you know where you'll be playing a weaker deck which might be a temptation for better players or even like like just Make people's choices matter, even if they're not going to be like super competitive players. You know, I would, I would definitely, definitely, you know, prefer something like that. So I, think... I, I definitely agree with your point on getting players who are not in the top bracket, because if we just, we want to incentivize all players, not just the top one percent of players or so on. And um, however, um. One of the ideas that I really like is um, having certain cards in your deck mean things. I know it's something we've discussed before. Um, so, right, like, I honestly, I think now is a perfect opportunity for it because pretty much all of the clans are split between one personality or another personality. Uh, so, for Dragon, it's between Mitsu and Hitomi. Not that there's any great uh, animosity between the two, but, you know, they're, they've both gone in different directions and whichever direction the, the clan goes in could be a big deal. So I'd love to see, um, you know, top of clan or whoever wins the event or, or something like that, even if it was possible to track all of them, but that might be logistically difficult. Uh, you know, are you playing Hitomi or are you playing Mitsu? Have you picked one or the other and made that decision? Or if you kind of go more broad, you can look at Satori or Daisetsu um, or even just that classic, are you playing Shadowlands or not? You know, there are some good cards and hopefully we'll start seeing more Shadowlands cards. And some players like the idea of having a little bit of taint because it keeps things interesting. Whereas others are like die hard, keep it solid, keep it pure, no Shadowlands cards at all. And I, I think those kind of those in game or those in deck building decisions are a wonderful um, opportunity to explore how uh, players kind of interact with the game. I think it gives people an opportunity to express themselves. And that's oh, and Mantis. Thing. Yep. Thank you, Hammer. Mantis needs need a shot too. Uh, you need to give those guys a, a chance. But I like I definitely think that system's it's an interesting idea. It's probably simpler to track in some ways because you only need to worry about the uh the post cut. But the thing is, if you get a good enough system built in the base four, recording any amount of data is simple. Like, if you have a word with some people, you have a word with uh, the genius that uh, writes Lotus Pavilion, and say, hey, is there a way to export this? And we could, like, you could make this quite easy in a lot of ways. You yeah. could make it really, really, really simple. And it would be really potentially very exciting. Um, and I, th I, I think that's a missed opportunity because they're putting effort in. But it's True. effort that comes in in a very unpredictable way. And sometimes there's good-hearted choices that are just not going to do what they think they're going to do. Like, uh, this system they come up with is an interesting idea. It's a way for three clans to get something. So some clans get something, some clans don't, which generates value to getting it. But like... And, like, this system is clearly, they've looked at the previous system 
uh, from the the Kunshu season, they realized that there was problems. Uh, largely that you needed to get uh, Azturan to run numbers for months on end before you had any idea what was going on. Like just just working it out was incredibly hard. Um, this new system is a lot easier, and I think that's what they were looking at. And you know, from that perspective, they've made a a really good improvement. You know, they've they've pushed ahead with something that's more streamlined that they it looks like they are going to be able to keep track of and they are going to be able to update on the website and they do have a page on the website which is great um, and they've committed to you know i'm not sure whether it's going to be updated weekly or monthly or after an event or but they have committed to actually updating it um, and i did see tyler make a post saying that you know it wouldn't be there if they didn't feel that they could update it which is great which is great um uh, yeah John's pointing out that it did have a page on the website last <laughs> year that never got updated, and they also committed. Let's 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 not be a downer on it. They've said great things, um, and I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. Um, but the efforts that they made to, to simplify the system are clearly a response to the old system and improving it. So yeah, they are going to. They're sitting down. They're making efforts to improve it, but unfortunately, I think part of it is that the FFG OP decision makers, the people who are sitting there, haven't really been involved in the event scene all the way through this. Uh, they don't, you know, they, because the majority of events have been kind of outsourced, um, even the ones over in Europe, while uh, the FFG guys have been on the floor and on site and helping support us, like they've been letting us, get on with it, which actually has been great. I have to admit, I, I have appreciated that. But at the same time, some of the nuances um, that you know we were giving as feedback maybe haven't hit home with the, the people who are doing this. And in this case, with this new system, at first blush, at first look, it seems good. There are, there seem to be new cards offered, you know, some sort of story impact maybe. But yeah, I mean, no one's going to pay any attention to it until the very end to see if we get a card or not. Um, no one's going to turn up to events just to to try get paired against the same clan in the the second day, unfortunately. So you know, yeah, there's progress. Uh, they are they are moving along. They are learning, and um, but this was definitely a missed opportunity. So uh, on the price, so. Yeah, I definitely think that end of it needs to be revised. On the good end, uh, the new price support looks really cool. You've got, uh, in the standard code eyes, you have a range of spot losses, uh, a bunch of clan-aligned ones for everybody, uh, Hantai Daisetsu as an unaligned one, uh, roll cards, air, earth, fire, water, void, metal mon tokens, and... Uh, acrylic honor dials for each of the great clans i'd be interested to see the size of the mon tokens are they suitable for fate or are they for are they larger are they for something else are, are they not the same as we had last time around well no they were badges these just say metal mon tokens oh. i don't know and if you look at the size of them there they're oh closer, yeah, yeah they are smaller than cards yeah, they are yeah, yeah. closer to the size of the things so that'll be really cool if that was, hey, let's put some cocoa on my guys, and I've got my clan cocoa to put on them, that'd be yeah. awesome. Um, yeah, that'd be amazing. You've got some uh, other nice bits and pieces. You've got a, a deck, nice deck box. I don't know if it's card or wood or wash or fabric. It is. It know? is card. It is card. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and this you, is for top sixteen, I think. Is this top sixteen, top eight, and top four at the deck box, and have a play mat. And an honor dial for a Kota Tuturi, uh, ex Emerald Champion, still wearing his Emerald Champion uni uniform. Spo Tuturi, spoilers. Tuturi. It says that the title, it's uh, he's former Emerald Champion. You know, please return your uniform. Uh, <laughs> you know, to the associated quartermaster. Thank you. You've got your Hadamoto playmats and dials. Top two gets another fancy playmat uh, and also a set of wooden ring tokens, which look great. And the champion gets a another yet another playmat and a uh, a scroll with an illustration of a Kodatori. The Grand Kodai have an additional stuff on the prize wall, a bunch of high end, high power characters, uh, for the most so part. I I do want to mention these playmats. Um 
we did give some feedback last year. And I, I know one of the things that we've said is that we submitted some feedback and nothing happened. Um, but those playmats uh, are one of the pieces of feedback we gave that um, you had, I think, top four from Worlds first time round all got Togashi Kazue as their playmats. I don't think any of them were Dragon players. Uh, I think the... Yeah, the, the Hadamoto one was Yakuni, and, you know, the line player who got that had no interest in it, quite frankly. Uh, but now we've got playmats that are a little bit more generic, that, um, and we had that for Winter Court, that um, you can sit down with a, be any clan. So, you know, I think people will be a lot happier winning these playmats than they are uh, clan locked ones, as it were. Yep. So, yeah, f- feedback is t- being taken on, which is fantastic. So new prizes, basically high-end characters, and then also uh, you can compete in side events. And also on the prize wall, you got uh, their clan champions in a with a different uh, the Kotai style art frames again. Which Let's is good. Let's stop on this one for yep. a second. Um, that Doji Hataru. Yes, that's the new Doji Hataru. That is the new Doji Hataru's art. Yes, we do that's not know the showed you. That is not the new Bayushi Shoju. Uh, you are abs- You are correct in both ways. That is the old uh, Bayushi Shoju's art. We do not say their text boxes, but that's true. That's it true. would. It is indicative that those are probably the old Bayushi Shoju and the new Doji Hitaru. So yeah, I'm not sure what's going on there. And yeah, as uh, John is pointing out, this is the fourth time we're getting these as promos. It is. Uh, hope you like your clan champion promos. <laughs> I think that I so, so at one stage I was told that the theory is that you can choose to bling out your deck with Kotai ones in one style, and then Winter Court ones are a different style, and then the Grand Championship ones are a third style. Um, that's one of yeah. the ideas. It's I, bold. I don't like that at all. It's bold. I'll get to that. I honest to goodness, I thought those Grand Championship ones, which are almost identical to these Kotai ones. But the skill uh, is in the top left, like all the other cards, like all the normal cards, uh, are just so much better. Um, I have a bundle of these Kotai promo style ones, and um, yeah, I, I just don't play them because uh, having your skills all over the place is just too confusing. Um, so uh, yeah, I thought they, I thought they learned that lesson, and I thought they had moved over, but um, apparently it's, it was just a, a turd style that they're going to be supporting. So, yeah, that, I, that was a little disappointing for me, I have to admit. But, you know, new promos, they look pretty, I, I can't argue, really. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and the Grand Championship, the only difference, I think, is the final, the championship match is different, and you get flights to Worlds, which used to be flights and accommodation, accommodation. I think is now just flights. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, un- un- unless it... it it wasn't mentioned, but actually is happening, as has occasionally occurred. Sometimes there are facts which aren't mentioned, and you should infer are no longer happening. And sometimes those are the, those are the unknown, no, unknown. Yeah, and sometimes there are facts which are still happening, but weren't mentioned. But you should have known they were happening. Yeah, which is some, which is some stuff we learned. It's all very complicated. All right. Yeah. So yeah, we. So, uh, yeah, so this this is a little bit disappointing to a certain extent because the the previous seasons have had participation stuff, and that participation stuff was cool. That said, um, you know we're missing out some playmats and stuff. So I mean, if if this cuts down the overhead on what there is for the events, uh, everyone's still going to get a massive amount of promos from all the kaku. Um, I'm not too upset by it, but I just think, figured to mention it. Yeah. Justin, any thoughts on all our ramblings? Um, no, not really. It's, you know, without knowing what's going on in the background in, in FFG, it's really, it's very hard to, to make any kind of statement. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously they're, they're reviewing and changing their, their processes internally. Um, so they've shown themselves to be open to feedback. Uh, in the past, and I know, I mean, I kind of get the feeling that, that uh, we, you know, it, it's it's coming across as, um, I don't know, I, I would hesitate to use the word entitled, because uh, that's an awful word, 
but um, impatient maybe is is better. Um, but you know, it's like I've I've worked in games companies before, and without knowing how things operate on the inside, it's it's honestly very very hard to say if something is neglectful or if something is you know if if you've got people doing the very best they can um if you know if the fault lies in the corporate structure of the company and how it's organized if you have people who simply don't have the necessary kind of powers and responsibility to 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 make changes and improve things in the way that they would um and you know just being on the outside of that and not understanding the internal workings um it's sometimes it's i you know it's sometimes it's 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 easy to criticize and to get upset about stuff like that. but you know generally if you sit down with someone and if they're ever to talk about it which is rare enough um you know there are very very good reasons for for all these things they may not be the kind of reasons that would make us happy um but yeah i mean in a lot of ways, you know, we, we don't have a lot of power. I mean, obviously, we don't have a lot of power. We are we are consumers as far as this game goes. Um, and certainly offering offering feedback is good. But I suppose this is actually mainly for FFG, if any FFG uh, employees are, are watching this, is that this, you know, these are any criticisms that we have come from a place of genuine concern and, uh, and love for the game, which can sometimes get lost in... Uh, in I don't know, just uh, general communication. I think just the the way that people communicate. Yeah. So yeah, it's I mean, so you know, I mean, we so we so we can talk about kind of being disappointed and this could have been done better and that could have been done better. Um, so yeah, I suppose just to sum up, you know, I'm pretty like I'm pretty sure they're trying their very best, um, but we don't know what kind of uh, obstacles that they're they they may be working against inside the company because. Games companies are strange beasts in a lot of ways. They don't work like normal companies for the most part. Um, so yeah, and mainly, you know, just for as I said, any FFG employees watching this is that any criticisms that we do have come from a a genuine love for the game and a genuine hope that um, the game can be made better. Like they're they're not an attack. It's not something we're not going after you or anything like that. Um, this isn't like our pack so. reviews. There's no aggression. Here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. I mean, you know, we want we want the we want the game to be successful. Um, yeah. So it's 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 just that. I mean, it's just something that I I know because I've seen both sides of the coin. Where you have you know uh, an I wouldn't say an upset player base, but a player base that uh, a restless player base perhaps, or a concerned player base. And sometimes the way those <clears throat> sometimes the way their concerns are phrased. Um, yeah, just because uh, communication, especially across the internet, uh, it's very, very hard. You know, you, you can't read body language. You can't actually have uh, a proper dialogue. And so if you've got kind of, when you've, when you've got criticism going in one direction for a, for a considerable length of time, it can make you pretty defensive. And I like, as I've, I've been, I've been there. I've, you know, I've been on the other side, on the other side of that. Um, so yeah, so it's just really you know for for players, you know, people at FFG are almost certainly doing their absolute best or the, the absolute best that they can, and for people at FFG, likewise, the players are doing and suggesting the the best solutions that you know yeah. that that they see and that occur to them, um, and yeah, there's just there's a bit of a rocky ground between there and like in the middle, just to be aware of it and you know. Like, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was talking with uh, one of the FFG guys at an event, and I said, hey, look, how many grand championships am I meant to go to? And he said, oh, just one. And I said, yeah, that's cool. Except the prize support is one copy of each card for getting a top 16 of the clan, and then one copy for whatever top eight it was, and, or top four. And I said, I have to go to three of these to get a play set. And the reaction was, huh, that did not occur to us or that didn't, uh, that did, that didn't hit. So it, sometimes it's just like, they think, okay, that looks fine. Everyone think that's fine. Yeah, that looks fine. And we've got it approved by our three, you know, our three different managers to all sign off and that's cool. 
and then that's grand and away we go. And I, I think it's just that there's a lot of hoops they have to jump through because they're a very big company that's been kind of amalgamated together. And the sum of it is just then thinking, okay, that's cool, right? And then either, you know, it not occurring to them or someone going, oh God, I'm not bringing this up. I'm not, you know, getting shouted at by everybody for why didn't I spot this earlier or whatever, you know? Like just to, like, oh, you know, just, it's just difficult, I would say. I think it's just dif- and, difficult. And for the players, like, uh, I don't just spend my free time thinking about this game. I spend my work time thinking about this game. Uh, but for people in FFG, if they've got any sort of common sense, like, it is a job for them. You know, they need to come in and do their nine to five and focus on doing the, the best job for probably the five or six different lines they're working on. You know, they don't have time to, to dedicate um, a vast amount of um, cognitive load and thinking and immersing themselves completely within the l 5 or community. So, you know, they, there's only, there's only so much that they're going to be able to do. So it, it can kind of seem like common sense for us who are within this, in this lifestyle, you know, we're in, this is, this is a, a gaming lifestyle and we're in this lifestyle and to, to see, you know, some of the OP guys that, you know, probably do their best to put this together, miss a couple of beats. You know, I can understand it. I can, I can be disappointed and I can understand it too. Um, so, yeah, I think as, as Justin's making the point, it's about everyone on both sides kind of understanding and trying to see if we can get that middle ground. Yeah. I mean, like the the players are are, are a really amazing resource that um yeah that shouldn't be uh, oh god it sounds really bad i mean they shouldn't be ignored of course the players shouldn't be ignored but there's an awful lot of of insight and knowledge and experience that you don't get you absolutely do not get as a as a designer um or a manager when you're working in a company like the experience of a of a designer or a manager is completely different from the experience of uh, of a player when it comes to a game um and you know the designers and managers shouldn't be afraid to to go to the players and genuinely sound them out on stuff because the players will come back with stuff that you know will make the the experience of playing the game or playing the games just more enjoyable and better because that's what players want so yeah you know it's like there's i think there's there's often a trap that uh, the companies fall into i mean well, I want to say a trap. Okay, like a lot of the times it's it's impossible. No, it's just a lot of the times it's impossible for a company to admit to shortcoming because if you admit to shortcoming, then it, like the optics on it are just really terrible. It is open um, season, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you you know you 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 do you, you leave yourself open to to further attack, and you basically just justified any attack that comes your way. Often, no matter how unusual and uh, unfair it is. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I've kind of slightly lost my train of thought. Do, 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 do. We, we, we have we have seen that with some of the com- computer game companies, where you know a company yes. makes a mistake, and obviously their player bases are much larger and in many cases much more rabid, I'd say. Um, but there's been horrible, horrible backlash uh, that has seriously negatively affected um, computer game designers, which, you know, is is a close relationship, I think, with uh, the kind of gaming community that, that we have. So I think maybe, like, maybe Tyler can kind of have some affinity for some of the sort of stuff that happens there. Our other employees within FFG, they can, they can see uh, computer game companies where the community can certainly be toxic and um, we've seen some pretty horrific um threats and things happen to designers because you know maybe they made a character the wrong color or they forgot about something minor like crazy things um but i like i i think we're nowhere like that i've i've certainly seen some bad behavior within the l4 community um, but overall, and ninety nine percent of the time, it's just a really committed and really dedicated, and um, I think maybe slightly stupidly uh, invested uh, group yeah. of people who just love this game. Yeah, sorry if I could actually now that I have my uh, 
my my thought back, back is that yeah yeah no absolutely is that you know for it can be very very difficult for yeah it can be basically a company can be put in a position where it's impossible for them to admit fault um and that then makes it look to the players like the company isn't listening at all um and that is very frequently not true. Um, but like I said, there is a big, there's like a no man's land of communication where it's, you know, you've got each side kind of lobbing grenades back and forward at the other one. Um, and no one ever actually kind of meets in the middle to, you know, uh, play a game of Christmas football, so to speak. So, yeah, it's a, basically, you know, for, 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 the, for the company, you shouldn't be afraid to, to, to reach out to the players um, and kind of identify you know the 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 kind of the, the pillars of the community and genuinely listen to what they have to say uh and for the players you know it's it's also worth realizing that sometimes uh companies especially big companies like this the people who are working inside them are, are bound and kind of uh hindered in ways that are just very very difficult for them to work around um so change can be slow you know, so, you know, a little bit of consideration on, on both sides and a little bit of acceptance and, um, uh, you know, just a bit more compassion on both sides and understanding can go a huge, can go a huge way to diffusing any kind of situation where antagonism and resentment genuinely starts to build between uh, a player base and its company. Okay. With that in mind, are we ready to start issuing our demands? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, like we could, like we can chat all night about stuff they they could do, but um, I was just I was just thinking, oh my god, we haven't reviewed the crab pack yet, uh, so we should definitely do that in two weeks. Um, but yeah, I think my Christmas holidays will be spent catching up on pack reviews. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get that one. To, uh, I'm working on the crab one actually. I've got I've got a few cards for reading it, so uh, I will pass that along. Um. What do I think? I think better communication is a must. Um, and that communication needs to be a bit more accessible to everybody. And like it happens at times, but it's kind of like looking after a plant. You can't just go out and give the plant two liters of water and expect it to be grand, depending on the size of the plant. You need to give it a little bit of water periodically. So regular small updates about stuff that's happening is good. Transparency about what's going on is good because that helps build uh, excitement. Uh, a revised set of prizes for story prizes for the uh, Kodai season this year would be good. Um, yeah. And uh, someone says that FFGOP is different as DOP. We are better aware of that than you might think. We are better aware of that than you might think. All right, Baz, any thoughts? Um. So, yeah, I mean, I think they've started out uh, and we have to accept that there's a couple of things that, you know, they can't change. And that's fine. Um, like, as I said, I'd, I'd love if the layout for the price support was different, but I'm assuming everything has gone printing at the moment. And that's that's a big deal. Uh, so, yeah, we, we got to accept some things like that. Um, I'm really disappointed that uh, they've taken out the Hadamoto webpage. Um, like originally, I started updating the page on Imperial Advisor because I figured there was going to be a month or two before they got around to updating theirs, and I just wanted to track that down. Two years later, we're still doing it, and that's really um, not acceptable. Uh, the the communication that they have or that they they've been do using has basically just been map posting on Facebook. That is not how players need to get their information. We need uh, stuff updated on the website, and we need Twitter. Like Those are two public places to get stuff out. Um, so I'm just noticing now that Twitter hasn't said anything about the Kodai article. Why not? Like I have no idea why not. Uh, they're... Like it, it just doesn't make sense, you know. And there's stuff that we hear from Matt that never goes up on onto the web page. And I think if if they just got a little bit better at nailing down uh, that regular those regular updates, that'd be great. Um, I want, as you said, maybe having a look at those tides of war prizes and reassessing them. Like what they've done made sense from an organizer's point of view, but it doesn't really make sense from a player's. There's nothing that drives. And if they just go for a real simple one, like um, 
you know, based on attendance or uh, cuts to top two or something. You know, I think that would that would help. You know, maybe necess- not necessarily get into looking at cards yet, unless they're they're willing to maybe start looking at decklists properly. Um, one thing on Hadamoto that is really interesting is on a stream that they did a while ago. Uh, they had these really fancy Hadamoto boxes. They were like wooden boxes, not like the the ones we had in the previous season. They were like fold over and things came in and out. Like, are they gone? Like they 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 popped up on the crab preview stream on Twitch for a minute or two and aren't part of this article. Now maybe it didn't work out and they just kind of released that a little bit too early. But if it is in there, good God, people, get that up. You know, talk about it. And um, something needs to be done with Hadamoto, uh, definitely. Uh, I I think a page that just had the name can't be that hard to do. You, you know, strip it back. Don't do the pictures. Don't do it all, the whole shebang. But just a name and a clan. You know, if I could do it, FFG can do it. And um, maybe remove the the clan loyalty part so it just reduces your bookkeeping slightly because that going tracking those was always a bit of a mess. Um, we talked about the tournament structure. If they could look at that, and yeah, we've talked about the proving grounds. Um, I think get rid of that charging in, that would go a long way towards things. And I think if, if you've gotten that far and made those few changes, I think you're in a fantastic place. Because the reality is, you know, apart from a few quibbles that we have and a few concerns, uh, it's pretty good, right? Boxes yeah. are for the top four. Hmm, okay. I was looking up Game Genic just in case it was them doing it. Oh, uh, so, uh, yeah, Felipe. Um, Felipe is Jose, right? So he's saying that the, those boxes were for the top four worlds, but they weren't given out. Um, yeah. Uh, no, actually, that's the thing. Um, yeah, uh, Steelfer is just talking about uh, redeeming shards in Keyforge for a chair. Uh, there, are, yeah, there are there are problems <laughs> and, and issues with that. Um, so they're still waiting for chairs, but I, I I would love to see a little bit more things for the repeat Hadamotos. Um, I think uh, the current prizes for Hadamoto are a little weak. Um, you get your play mat, and then the next time you do another play mat. So they've removed those wooden boxes that they used to have. Honestly, like if it was an extra title for someone who managed to get all of the clans during the season, that would drive a lot of players to compete. Um, I'm not sure what you would do for someone who get gets repeat out mode on the same clan, but you know something. It doesn't have to be something big. Um, often, like a, a another title, surprisingly, Alpha Four players are raving for that kind of stuff. So. You know what I do for Hadamoto? Uh When you uh, get Hadamoto, you win a special uh, a special roll card, which is weaker than a standard roll card. And if you win Hadamoto again in the season, you get something else. So you basically have to notch up your difficulty and still play. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, okay, I want to win. I want to get double Hadamoto or I want to advance up the Hadamoto ranks. Like there's a whole military rank structure you could put in. Like you get this one. It's got two less influence. It's It brings you up to not Rick and Chokan, but whatever. That's the next one. If you can get to that, you get to that. Cool. Here's the next one. You get five less influence now. Get to work, you know? And so, maybe maybe that's a, a little elaborate. Uh, it is a little even, elaborate, but that's the kind of stuff that gets people going. Yeah, you know? it's pretty but awesome, I, though. It, it is kind of awesome. But like even just a a roll card that says you're Hadamoto. So yeah. you know, not it, it doesn't even have to be the roll card, but a card you can put down in the game, and that says you're Hadamoto. You know, it has no effect. Like tiny things like that. They like they make difference. So uh, yeah, I think, I think. They looked at Hadamoto, realized that they had some logistic issues and have cut things back to the point where they feel like they're comfortable doing it. But unfortunately, they've trimmed that back too much. Like literally all it is is, you know, a warm handshake and a a mat that, you know, if you've already got it, you've already got it. So, you know, I think I think there's there's opportunities to improve that because it is supposed to be, you know, one of the kind of premier sought after things. And right now, you know, we're, we're really just down to a title. Uh, I think you can do more stuff with it that doesn't require a lot of a lot of effort, but would mean a lot. And I think there's ways to do things that are easy 
that uh yeah it's like there's ways to do things that are easy that uh you could do without too much difficulty and i think they would be quite cool i think they would be quite cool and there'll be ways to do yeah like if your hadamotos earned a pool of points that was for the clan and then there was a vote of worlds about okay what do we spend our points on you know and do stuff like that you could there's tons of things you could do a lot of players said that they really enjoyed the fact that the Hadamoto were the ones who voted on the costume contest. Yes. Because people it's like... A tiny thing. Uh, and the Hadamoto getting a choice at, uh, at UK Games Expo for what happened with the uh, what happened with the investigation by the Phoenix. Yeah. People cared about that. Uh, and I was told that it was obvious which way I was going to get voted. And I said, there's one vote in the difference. It was as close as it possibly could be. Yeah. Yeah, it was down to the wire. Yeah, so yeah, I think stuff like that would be great. Uh, Justin, any thoughts? Toss in with us, or are you happy enough? Oh, happy enough, I think. Alrighty. Alrighty. So we've wobbled on for an hour and a half, uh, talking oh. about, you know, stuff. We've got a crab pack review that we have to do. We've got a dragon pack review that will be coming along on the heels of that. And then we'll have a clan war review when that comes out, probably in January. And hopefully... We'll start hearing about the new cycle shortly. Um, and we have uh, Shoju's duty as well. We've got the... the oh, hang on a second. To do. Did you guys get the names for the new cycle? Yes, we did. Yes, you did. We had them previously. They're, they're all yeah. super... If, if you have them yeah. handy, read them out again, because they're, they're actually super exciting. Hang on. Uh, right. Let me see. Yeah, I just, I just got a, a ping from the shop about pre-ordering uh, everything. So... Um, da, 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 defenders of rock again, seekers of wisdom. Or are these rock, the dragon? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, excuse me, excuse me. Okay, spreading shadows, in pursuit of truth, campaigns of conquest, as honor demands and atonement. So awesome. those are, those are the only ones I've got. Have I missed any? That's, that's pretty hype. So, is that six yeah. of them? Uh, spreading shadows in pursuit of truth campaigns as honor demands. No, that's only five. So yeah, I don't know. So it's obvious that there's one off. There's one missing from the bottom. Who knows? Anyway, yeah. that's that's what they sent me. That's what they sent me for like pre-order ping. So I was. Uh, so I just said yes. Please. <laughs> More maho, please. Oh yes, all the maho. More shadowlands. L5R is coming home. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we'd love it as well if people had insights or things you'd like us to toss around as an idea or suggestions for us about other things that would be good uh, to put our to like put a little bit of advocacy towards and maybe, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, bring up at some point. Uh, if people have suggestions and things, we're happy to chat either if we see you guys at a code eye or something or if uh, you want to mail us or whatever. Contact us on social media, you know, all the usual stuff. We'd be really happy to have a chat about it and see what, what people are actually after, what people actually want. And, uh, so, so, yeah, just I just see in chat, that's that's one last detail we need to know about the upcoming Kodai season. We need to know about the upcoming Kodai season. Yes, uh, we do. With that. Right, right now, we just have packs unplugged and no one has any idea what's happening for the rest of the season. So, yeah, that'll, that'll be fun. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. Alrighty. So I think that's us wrapping up for today. Guys, thanks for hanging out and chat. Uh thanks for engaging with us on this topic. Thanks for listening to us ramble on. Uh as I said again, upcoming reviews of some packs coming up and we'll chat some more about this stuff. And for the moment it is goodbye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for listening. All the best. <laughs>